Hi everyone, your chess puzzler here, and welcome to the channel. There are millions of games. There are millions of them to feature. But the game I have lined up for you today is not something you get to see every day. I'm going back to the 2016 Ultimate Blitz Challenge, where this guy, who's regarded by many to be the greatest chess player of all time, took part in the Ultimate Blitz. This was a five minute plus three second game. It was the first game played between Wesley So and Gary Kasparov. So old generation, if you like, the new generation. But with Gary having been away from active chess, has he got what it takes after all these years? Let's see. Gary White went for an E4 opening and Wesley responded with E5. After knight f3 and knight c6, one thing Gary's not going to do is to go for something usual. So avoiding the Spanish and the Italian, he went for this, the Scotch, which is something right up his street. Takes, takes. And after the knight was developed, Gary traded in the knight for the knight, and this is how West recaptured, not to drop the queens because the king would lose his castling rights. And already from the word go, Gary goes for the knight. So where was his knight to go? Wesley pinned this guy, and after queen e2 and knight d5, Gary chased after this knight. And rather than get this knight to safety, this is what Wesley does. And what again we have, and we are still in single figure moves. These guys are razor sharp. B3 was followed by this response. And look at this Kasparov move, wanting the queen on e7. Wesley covered in the most weird of ways. Knight b4 is very interesting, but d6 is not bad either. But Wesley covered in this way. Gary's answer here, g3, and this bishop will hit the diagonal and everything in his path. Bishop g7, and we know Kasparov wants so much to get this bishop out, but before he does, he will need to deal with this problem at hand. He shot off with this guy, and only now this knight redirects to b4. Bishop g2 and rook d8 got this knight rolling, and if you think the scotch is boring, well, this is a scotch and it's far from boring and what a twist to it. Wesley got his king to safety and Gary here came up with this very effective resource. He dropped the bishop back to be able to chase after this knight. The version of this scotch was used by Gary to beat Karpov in the championship match in, I think it was 1990. But what if he tried this a move earlier? There is bishop takes, and after the knight goes after the queen, this is something. Okay, the answer is this queen move. And black has the whole thing covered, but also has ideas of going after this corner rook and stops white from castling. And this is why Gary did not want to engage through this proposed exchange. If any side has to be in trouble, it has to be black. It's all about this monster pawn on e5, and right now, only d6 is going to break him up. But how dangerous is this knight on b4? As we speak, it doesn't seem to be extremely dangerous, but by dropping the bishop back, Gary's probably going to kick him to c6. And how does Wesley handle the situation here? He's down on time by half a minute, or he was down by half a minute, but any time advantage Gary had was consumed here. He just didn't want to hand over his bishop for the knight. The knight was initially attacked right after d5. And when this guy slipped in, the position suddenly explodes. A takes, d takes, and bishop takes, got this guy off two. And the situation is intense, very intense given the nature of the game. With white to move, this game is by no means simple. The bishop on c3 is attacked, but also this guy on a6 is also exposed. 
Do you trait the bishops and only now go for this bishop response? Locking out everything, or do you go for this line to retain the white bishop and allow this bishop on a6 to escape? For better or worse, this is what Gary did. And when the bishop made a run for it, taking a7 is not recommended because after this queen response, queen c5, white would have a very hard time castling. So Kasparov castled first, and now Wesley wants to break up this solid pawn formation by white and has f6 on the board. I remember the commentators, and specifically Maurice Ashley, using an engine as an aide, specifically said this f6 was a blunder. But can you see where this blunder is? This is where everything happens, in fact. And see how fast Gary's to take full advantage of the situation. Have you seen it, guys? Bishop d5 check, and Wesley sacrifices the exchange and hands over his rook. So why not king h8 or even bishop e6? Bishop e6 runs into this. e takes f6. And when the bishop takes, bishop takes e6, check, and black loses material. So how does a king move to the corner fair? Are you ready for this, guys? Because this is going to hurt. After e takes, yes, the queen drops. But do this. And what good is this move when you have this very painful e takes g7 mate? And what a classic this would be to drop the queen and mate using a single pawn. And I hope I have convinced you why, why the rook had to come off here. So Gary's up by an exchange, but he will need to drop something. And this is what Wesley does. Rook f2 to cover. And when this pawn dropped, has Wesley picked up the wrong guy? It seems he does. It seems he does, because when e5 was removed, Gary simply removed e5 with his bishop. And right after this, both players have amazingly used the same amount of time on the clocks. How do we know? Well, <laughs> I hope this screenshot gives it all away. At the time of this take, we have a two seconds difference, and thank God I have Save this screenshot as evidence. Black is a full exchange down. And with this queen being an absolute monster on e5, she will wait here for the right time to make her mark. It's also very easy for us from where we sit to judge games like these. But do try a five minute blitz and you'll see how tough things are for both players. You can do anything, but one thing you can't afford to do is to get flagged because if you do, you will auto lose this game. Wesley tried to dismantle the center through this rook move. But when this rook joined in to be able to cover, Wesley attacks his rook. With the rook on f2 being pinned, this is how Kasparov dealt with this situation. And Wesley knows if the queens come off, this will be the end of it. So he avoids the trade. But look where the queen had to go. Rook d2 getting out of danger. Got this rook realigning to e8. Trying to hold key squares. King g2, queen b5. And Gary has to go for this bishop. And okay, he does. And if we look at both Gary's and Wesley's times, they're down to just a minute and something. And let me see if I have another screenshot for you. Yep, here it comes. And those three seconds difference may make a big change to the game. And you can clearly see Gary's hand is off to reach his clock. Bishop back, g4. And this check by Wesley, who really took his time here, wasn't his last move screenshot at 1.17. And this is his time now, right after his check. And we're not talking about 26 seconds down, but add that increment and that makes it just under half a minute for a single move. But even people like Wesley, is he able to turn things around with only 54 seconds left? King h2 in an instant c5 and Kasparov 
is playing on instinct. And for someone who was away from the game for so long, he knows exactly where the queen needs to go. He placed her on f6, and when c4 closed in, d6, and this pawn has to be the pawn with a difference. Bishop back to stop the pawn led to this crushing response, and even players like Wesley can panic because his next move was his demise. He attacked the queen, but right after this check, king g7, I guess that f5 was such a dominant move. Taking g6 is all you need, but why complicate matters when you can simplify through this move? Dropping the queen back to b8 with a check does nothing after rook d6, but Wesley went for this queen response. And you can just promote, but Gary doesn't care. He went for the trade, and this was good enough for Wesley to resign. But we are talking after all about a true legend who, even at this age of 53, makes his game look so easy. Is he as intimidating as he used to be? Extremely. And look at what he does here. He gets the queen ready for promotion. Wesley had stopped the clock. And if you observe carefully, he had only five seconds left. He knew he was buried when he committed to that total blunder when he went for that F6. So why didn't Wesley lose his first ever game with Gary? Shall we hear it from the man himself? I'm relieved. I mean, I was very nervous yesterday. I haven't, uh, I mean, I'm not very experienced with top level blitz like this. <laughs> of course, the first time playing Gary Kasparov uh, was uh, nervous and I would say inexperienced. Did Wesley just say he's inexperienced? Certainly being nervous is part of the game, but I'm not sure he's inexperienced unless he was being specific about playing blitz at this high level. And before I leave you for today, there is something else. I remember I had many thumbs down when I previously said Tarjan was now an amateur. He is a librarian who won Kramnik back in 2017 in the Isle of Man. And even though he's a GM, he's still an amateur. Gary now also falls in the same category. And before anyone goes wild on me, let's hear it from the man himself. I, you know, and I was on the side. Okay, I was an amateur in this game. Yeah, it's just, it's, it was, yeah, it was a total disaster. So it's a bad game. It's a nice game. So, but it's... If you also open any dictionary, do read the definition so you have a clear idea what the difference is between an amateur and a professional. Okay, this was the first game between Wesley Soul and Gary Kasparov, who played a tremendous all-round game. Wesley on this occasion faltered, but this was a blitz game, and even players know how robust these games can be. I'm going to bring out the follow-up games and how Kasparov actually did against Wesley and against other players. Hope you enjoyed because these blitz games are truly remarkable. So until next time, guys, this was your chess puzzler.